Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Isherwood. I'm Chief Executive of the ISE, and welcome to our latest webinar. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Sophie Meany from Amberjack and David Barnes from, from BDO. Um, and they'll introduce themselves a little bit more, more fully shortly, but let me just give you a quick rundown of how the, the webinar works. Um, if you haven't tuned into one of our webinars before, and as attendees, you're all on mute because they get we get such a high attendance rate that we all end up talking over each other when we when you've got questions to ask. But we really do want your questions, so please use the dialogue box within dialogue box within this platform. And um, so, if you put your questions into there, um, I will moderate them, and we've got time at the end um, when I can put your questions to Sophie and David. So please, really do make use of that tool, and then and, and I'll put them put them through at the end. And um, the webinar is recorded automatically. Um, so as um, as somebody who registered for this, you will get an email a bit later today, which will give you a link to to the to the webinar. So if you want to go back um, and revisit some of the stuff we talked about, you'll be able to do that. And also, uh, throughout this crisis, we've made our webinars and podcasts available to all recognizing that at times like this actually we all need to collaborate and share information as much as possible so please feel free to share the webinar with your with your networks and with your with your peers that would be great um, okay so that's enough from me um, I'll, I'll shut up for a while and turn my webcam off and come back in when it's question times so Sophie let me let me hand over to you many thanks Stephen hi everybody um, for those of you who don't know me my name is Sophie Meany I'm managing director here at Amberjack I'm really looking forward to sharing with you today uh, a few thoughts and um, suggestions and recommendations around efficiency and effectiveness when it comes to future talent recruitment. Um, but most delighted actually to be uh, sharing the, uh, I was gonna say stage, but screen um, <laughs> with, with David Barnes uh, from BDO, who's going to be sharing, I'm sure the most interesting piece, which is the journey um, that they have been on. So um, David and I are gonna introduce ourselves and like Stephen, we will also turn off our webcam so you can have the um the slides full screen and then we'll be back again at the end for the questions so david over to you great so hi everyone my name is david barnes i'm um a senior resourcing manager at bdo so my role here is essentially to lead the um uh early and careers team um i've been doing that since uh january and prior to that i was um still working for bdo so i've been at bdo about a year and a half. Prior to that, I was at Moore Stevens before we merged into BDO. And then prior to that, I was um, head of resourcing for a bank called Close Brothers and uh, have been in the resourcing world for a while before that. And as Sophie said, we're looking, um, you know, as I, as I took over in January and looked at um, how our season was going and um, how our looked in depth at the um, MI. That's when we started thinking how we need to improve our efficiency for next year. Um, and uh, we got in touch with Amberjack to, to help us formulate that solution. Thank you very Marvelous. much. Marvellous. So David, I'm gonna turn off my video now. You may choose to do likewise. And well. then hopefully everybody will then have full screen on the slides. So. Clicking through just to give you a sense of what we're going to cover today. I'm going to have a, a brief um, moment looking at you know, the current landscape um, and then talking about why that landscape is uh, driving an increased focus on efficiency and effectiveness. Um, we have actually got a paper on uh, efficiency and effectiveness in future talent programs, which we will circulate uh, afterwards for people who've signed up for this webinar, which, you know, gives you the, the detail behind what we're going to share on a high level today, but we've got a sort of four-step um, process for reviewing uh, your processes to optimise efficiency and effectiveness, and I'm going to talk that through. And then we'll move on to the, the main story. Uh, David will, will talk to you about uh, the BDO recruitment process, as was historically, and, and what we're doing to transform that, um, and then what our expectations are beyond that. I'll jump back in to give you a, a little bit more of a deep dive into some of the tools that we're implementing in partnership with David's team. And then um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to um, answer your questions. Equally, we'll be sharing our email addresses. If there's anything you'd rather follow up with us um, offline afterwards, uh, then that's absolutely fine as well. So the outlook. We were already facing into the greatest velocity of change that we've ever seen. Um, we were already seeing the rate of digital adoption above and beyond anything that's happened previously. This was coming from a combination of 
you know, increase in infrastructure, um, bandwidth, cloud computing. We're also seeing the emergence of data lakes, which are joining up data um, and, and creating a more connected data world. And all of this, they, all of this was pushing us um, in a in a rapid, um, rapidly towards highly automated digital processes. And and interestingly, the future talent space was already further up the curve on this than other aspects of resourcing. But what we've seen um, with coronavirus, as we're all very well aware, is an even further acceleration of what was already quite a um, a staggering velocity of change. You know, the future has very firmly, um, certainly for the short term, but probably forever, um, become even more heavily virtual, ever more heavily automated. And when we combine this with, you know, not just coronavirus, but also the reality of um, the really challenging economic environment that we're facing into, um, the, the level of uncertainty that surrounds everything that we're doing, there really is a very, very heavy focus now on optimizing everything that we do. And in this sort of challenging landscape, um, some people find it a little bit off-putting, but I'm perhaps a little bit unusual in this, in that I really like a challenge. I tend to find that these sorts of circumstances where you know, we're all under pressure uh, to, to do the most we possibly can with the resources available to us, really does create an opportunity for optimal excellence. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, those sort of particular key anchors, but where I think organisations have an opportunity to use these challenging circumstances to really drive significant and continual improvements in the ways in which they go to market to um, find their future talent. So just focusing first on effect, efficiency and effectiveness. I mentioned we have a, a four-step model. And the first one is uh, to review the process and to review the process for efficiency and effectiveness. And so when we're talking about efficiency, um, we've got a few measures of efficiency, the first of which unsurprisingly is, is time. Um, so time to offer, you know, how rapidly are we getting a candidate from the point of initial engagement to the point at which we're offering them? You know, a few years ago, uh, it was fairly common for that to be, you know, six months. I think we're now in a world where organisations really should be expecting to give candidates an outcome within two weeks, and certainly that's absolutely, absolutely achievable. It's also about the amount of time or hours a candidate needs to invest in a process. Again, we don't have to go back very far in order to remember a world in which candidates were expected to you know, invest a significant number of hours just in the application form stage. Typically these days now, you know, that, that phase is automated, and candidates are typically, or certainly some of the, the most efficient processes, able to get all the way to the point of um, you know, selection for assessment centre without needing a recruiter intervention, but also while only needing to invest um, to the point of offer, perhaps a whole day of their time, where historically they might have needed to invest multiple days. And that's not just because of the shortness or the efficiency of the selection tools available, but also obviously because we're in a world where you know, virtual removes the need for, for travel. We can also look at efficiency from a, a cost point of view, a cost efficiency perspective. Hard cost, that's the obvious one and the one that most people focus on, but also significantly and one that I know David's going to bring to life, recruiter hours. You know, how many hours from your recruitment team are being invested in managing your process and is there a way to optimise this? either in terms of automating aspects of the process or in reducing the actual assessment hurdle. And it depends on the organisations and the future talent processes, but also there are organisations out there where there is still a significant time toll on um, members of the business, hiring managers, um, who get heavily involved in a recruitment process. And while clearly we don't want to move the, remove the level of ownership from those individuals, um, you know, there are, there are um, significant opportunities to reduce the burden that sits on their shoulders and create the circumstances in which they're only dealing with the most heavily qualified applicant pool in order to make the most efe efficient investment of their time. So those are some of the things that we typically look at from an efficiency point of view. And if we divorce efficiency from effectiveness, what do we mean by effectiveness? And effectiveness really comes down to quality. Are you hiring the right people? 
how can we measure this? What are the things that we typically look at? You know, the first is obviously, you know, um, whether or not you're able to fill your vacancies. And then it's about, you know, the average tenure of the hire, the performance ratings of those hires, the rate of promotion of those individuals against your core employee population. But really importantly, let's not forget candidate facing measures as well. You know, the offer acceptance rate, which gives you an indication of the quality of your, the candidate experience. Ideally as well, most organizations these days are actually measuring candidate experience, typically or ideally through net promoter scoring. Um, we, we have that as integrated into on our ATS and a lot of organizations are using that these days. It's becoming a little bit of a market expectation or norm. But even if you can't do it that way, you know, surveying candidates and getting their feedback and then the other really critical measure of quality, um, which is also having a lot of focus these days, is of course diversity. You know, the, the diversity of the applicant pool you're able to achieve in the end. How diverse is it? Does the diversity of your applicant pool represent the diversity of the locations that you're hiring those individuals into? Are you able to address any imbalances in the diversity of your organisation through the population that are coming in at the future talent stage, where typically it's easier to turn the dial than later? These sorts of areas typically go into the important rather than the urgent bucket. And I know for an awful lot of future talent or even overall recruitment leaders, sorts of things they really want to get to focus on, but typically get, keep getting pulled into urgent tasks, which may not be quite as important, but are time critical. And I think you know, at this stage where we're under this level of pressure to do more with less, you know, leaders really need to find the um, time to step back and focus on these critical issues because they'll then be able to create greater levels of um, capacity during their recruitment process and better outcomes for their business at the end. So that's reviewing the process. The next question is reviewing the profile. I think in a world in which we're facing the level of change that we're facing, it's really hard for organisations to know who they need to recruit. You know, I think in the past, historically, we've looked at past performance as a predictor of future success. But when tomorrow is going to look so different from yesterday, we can no longer rely on that. Historically, we've focused heavily on you know, academic achievement as a proxy for predicting success in organisations. But we're moving into a world in which the more technical or academic, the left brain tasks, the things that academics are a better proxy for assessing, those aspects of and in a success profile or high profile, those are the things that are more typically being automated and being taken over by the computers and the machines. And it's the right brain thinking, the holistic thinking, the creative thought that differentiates people from machines and is increasingly being the thing that is um, you know, identifying the right talent. So when we can't anchor in past experience and we can't anchor in you know, academic achievement, what can we anchor in? And the answer is, you know, when everything's uncertain, the thing that is most important to focus on is potential. An individual who has high potential is going to be able to be successful, whatever tomorrow holds. Uh, and it's also really important that we are assessing a whole person and we're not just looking at narrow aspects of that individual. Historically, organisations have used a recruitment process to review different aspects of that individual. But if you're looking at one aspect in isolation from the whole, you do run the risk of introducing either false positives or false negatives. So false positives where you bring somebody through who might be strong in one particular area, but not strong in the rest. And false negatives where you decline somebody who might be just a little bit below your benchmark in the area you're focusing on, but really excellent in all the other areas. And when you look at them on a whole basis, um, potentially really effective. So. I think you know, from a review profile perspective, we need people to look at what they're hiring for, are they hiring for potential? And is their recruitment process allowing them to assess that whole person at all stages through the process? I've talked about the recruitment, the, the future being highly automated. I mean, that's no new news to anybody I know. But in this world, which is so highly automated, one of the most critical questions is, are you using the right technology? And when we're talking about reviewing technology, we have a sort of a few points here that we typically anchor in. First of all, are you automating the right thing? You know, technology is excellent at um, replacing or taking over commoditized tasks, doing a task that require linear thinking. But people are excellent at the more complex tasks which require comp creative or holistic thinking. And they're also obviously far better at relationships. 
So when you look at your end-to-end -end process, is technology doing the right stuff? Is technology creating efficiencies so that your people can use those interpersonal skills to best affect to manage stakeholders to engage candidates? Second, we look at you know, the level of um, effective intervention. So is the technology used the minimum effective intervention in order to create the greatest level of simplification and to speed up the process? We look at whether or not it allows candidates to self-serve and gives them on-demand access. You know, Self-service for candidates is a, you know, an, an excellent opportunity because not only does it improve the candidate experience, but it obviously also in, in, introduces significant efficiencies for recruiters. It's a, a really quick win to put candidates more fully in control. And then one of the other things that people often forget to focus on is whether or not the technology is future-proof. Future-proof technology is typically modular, so you can remove or upgrade one module without having to remove or upgrade the whole. You know, as well as being module, modular, it does need to be easy to upgrade, and the organisations or technologies you're partnering with do need to have a really clearly articulated roadmap and with a progressive, uh, you know, significant pace of progression on that roadmap. We also recommend that organisations don't introduce technology as a feature. We've certainly seen situations where people have seen their technology intervention as the piece that differentiates their recruitment experience. The challenge of that in that when we're facing into a pace of um, a velocity of change and automation that we're facing at the moment is it very quickly goes out of date and very quickly what was a big differentiator is uh, you know something that potentially makes you look a little bit dated. So we always say use your technology as enabler, make sure the platform is there to showcase your EVP don't make the platform your EVP. So don't use the platform as the differentiator, use the platform to showcase the things that truly differentiate your organization. And then although it's last in this process, it's interwoven through everything we've said, you know, your data, are you capturing the right data at all stages in the process? And are you then using that data to good effect? And typically we'll find organizations have great data for certain parts of the process, but then Actually, ironically, the further you get down the recruitment process, the data often gets worse. We see organisations that aren't properly capturing the rich assessment data at assessment centre, organisations that then don't capture the performance data once individuals join, or if they capture it, they capture it in the sort of blunt performance rating manner as opposed to against the criteria that are being used as part of the success um, profiling. Can you analyse the predictive effectiveness of your process? That's the, you know, the ultimate question. Have you got the, the recruitment data that gives you that insight? And then obviously from a diversity and inf inclusivity perspective, are you able to access all of that information at the individual group level? So we're not categorising people into BAME, but we're looking at each of those individual minority groups and we're able to analyse um, you know, the performance of uh, you know, one group versus another and make sure that the process is not just effective, but also fair. Talked a little bit about candidate experience. Are you measuring it? How are you measuring it? What are you doing with that data? And then with the, the data, are you actually using the right data points in order to make your hiring decisions? And has the, have the data points that you need to anchor in changed, um, uh, particularly as a result of this significant change in environment that we've faced into? So that's just a little bit of framing um, before we then I hand, I hand over to David, who's going to talk a little bit about um, the BDO experience. And hopefully you'll see through the story um, how we've been working with David and his team in order to look at the two lenses he asked us to review from the start around both the efficiency and the effectiveness. So David, I'll hand over to you at this point. Right. Thank you, Sophie. Um, next slide, please. So for those of you that don't know, BDO is an international um, accountancy and advisory firm. Um, we're in 162 countries across the world um, and we, um, yeah, we provide an exceptional service delivering through that network. Um, in terms of BDO UK, um, which is the main area that I work for, we've got 17 um, locations across the UK with around 5,500 staff. In terms of our um, early careers program, it's fairly standard for an accountancy firm. We have um, we do a one-week summer school, um, a six-week internship program. Again, that's over the summer. Um, this year it was reduced slightly and made virtually um, due to the current uh, market conditions. 
Um, we have a four-year apprenticeship program and then a three-year um, graduate program. Next slide, please. So, as I said, um, I joined uh, the early careers side of um, BDO in January, and there were some challenges that we were we could clearly identify at the time, and um, I'll talk through those now. What I would essentially say is when it comes to um, efficiency um, and, and understanding uh, where your lack of efficiency is or inefficiencies are, and then how to improve on that, as Sophie has already mentioned, it's all about that reviewing the data. So when I joined BDO, one of the first things I did was bring in a, a very um, strong MI analyst who I'd worked with before, um, and she worked you know, from, from Christmas onwards to start producing uh, a whole array of reports and dashboards, over uh, 100 in total, um, that we didn't have before, um, all around our pipelines and um, other areas as well, so that we could literally review those, some of them on a daily basis, some of them on a monthly basis, to really track where um, where those that resource drain and where those inefficiencies were coming from. So I can't stress that enough. And um, we we're, we're seem to be moving to work day where we'll be able to improve that even further. So where, in terms of the project scope, when we um, started looking at this, um, we had a huge resource drain um, on the team. So we had a number of fixed term contract hires um, in the business to actually help us just get through the season to be able to um, process all the work that we needed doing um, and additional outsourced um, support as well. Where that mainly came into, and I'll talk in a bit more about it, is, is from our video interview uh, process. We had a very long video interview um, that took a long time to score. In fact, um, we worked out it took uh, 3,666 man hours um, or per year to get through those video interviews and score them. Um, and obviously this, this is not something that's efficient and not something we wanted moving forward, especially in these times. Um, we wanted to reduce our time to hire. Now, by Christmas, end of December, um, uh, we had only hired 25% of the demand, um, and that total was 665 uh, graduates and apprentices. Um, so having only hired 25% of that by Christmas, we were not in a, a strong position there, uh, and the overall time to hire was, was at least four months on that. Moving to... Um, improving effectiveness. So when our MRE analyst came in, the first thing we were doing is really going into great detail on our pipelines. And what we had um, established is that there were um, the, the benchmarks in those in certain areas of those pipelines, um, especially around the online assessments, were um, really too high um, for where they needed to be. And once we had done this analysis, we actually had to go back and do some reinstatement. So, so we um, lowered that benchmark to, to an appropriate level, one that still gave us the top quality candidates, but wasn't sort of uh, over-engineering the process. Um, and then these uh, false negatives, essentially, we reinstated these candidates. They got through to assessment center and scored um, very well. Um, so we could tell that those through the MI um, we could tell that we were uh, over-engineering our process and actually it was it was inefficient and one of the reasons why we'd only filled 25% of our roles by, by the end of December. And then improving the candidate experience was another goal for us because we had a, you know, a lengthy process, which I'll talk about shortly. The reinstatements as well, it's never good to go out to candidates that, you know, have been rejected and, and to, to invite them back in. Um, and then we had no um, real way of um, virtualizing our assessment center, which obviously towards um, the end of the season was critical um, so that we could continue to recruit. Um, so that was led to poor candidate experience and working with Amberjack, they helped us to put in a new sort of temporary one. And then we're gonna be working with them moving forward um, to uh, improve that for next year and have a, a very strong one. So what did our process look like last year? So we had the application form, fairly standard. Then we had three separate um, online assessments. They were um, all quite lengthy and the candidate would have to take one after the other, assuming they passed 
Um, and um, yeah, so it was, you know, inefficient. It could have been done in a quicker way, but also um, it, it wasn't the best candidate experience overall. Then for those that passed, we had the, the video interview. And um, uh, as I've alluded to so far, there were the video interview was too long. I think there was more questions than, than were required to effectively assess um, uh, the candidates that were coming in. I've got um, a reasonably strong background in assessment and, and a lot of the questions as well perhaps weren't giving us um, the information we needed to do uh, a, a really sort of um, accurate assessment of their, their skills. Then we had the assessment centre and our um, conversion rate there was pretty good. Um, we did have some challenges around um, the assessment centres being all across the UK and having lots of different offices. Um, uh, there were some challenges around that, which I'll, I'll come on to shortly, and then the offer stage as well. So, in terms of the overall process, as I've said, it was very time consuming, not only for us as a team, um, you know, I think we were probably three over our headcount with fixed term contractors by um, just to deal with the, the, the volume of these video interviews and other, other work. Um, and for the candidates, it was also fairly time consuming as well. After they'd had their assessments, they had to then go on and book for their uh, video interview as well. I think we we had that process designed, you know, certainly I, I believe around four years ago and at the time that was fit for purpose. But moving forward now we're in a fairly different world to where we were um, four years ago and um, the process in today's world is fairly linear and, and outdated. Um, with the, the um, false negatives being produced on our, um, from our assessments, um, there was, uh, I think, an opportunity for, for bias that was introduced there and in a, in a host of other areas as well. Um, and then overall that resulted in a, in a poor candidate experience. So um, something that we're looking to improve with our, with our new process. So what are we looking to achieve this year? We're aiming to fill 80% of our vacancies by the end of December this time, not 25%. Um, one of the biggest ways we're going to be able to do this is with um, uh, the, the new online assessment platform that we have. It's, it's, it's online and um, useful for face-to-face -face, uh, assessment centers as well. So we had challenges where we would have small offices, maybe Ipswich, for example, where we had a very small number of candidates applying just because of the location um, and then too many candidates being filtered out by our assessments. And what would happen is we had assessment centers of um, eight and we would often get two candidates that were ready for assessment center, but they had to wait quite a long time before they could um, uh, actually attend because we needed to fill up the assessment center um, uh, locally so that we could conduct it. And that's never a good candidate experience. With the, the, the new um, platform that we have, not only does it allow us to do online um, assessment centers, but we can um, merge different offices. So I can merge Ipswich and Bristol, and let's say they've both only got three candidates because we have six in our um, process this year, then we can um, run an, that assessment center with the two different offices combined and it's all done virtually. And actually you can have, you know, with, with the platform we can have, you know, any number, we can have a hundred candidates come in on one day. And as long as we, we, could, uh, we orchestrate it all through the platform and um, can have multiple offices and different uh, business streams and, all, uh, and such like all into one assessment day. And that allows us to plan our assessment centers a lot better um, based on when we have people available rather than when the, the assessment centers fill up. Um, so with that, we're looking for a 50% reduction in assessment days, and we're already planning out those assessment days at the moment, and that's uh, all on target for that. Um, we want a 50% reduction in application to hire ratio. Now, because of those um, over-engineered uh, um, uh, benchmarks and, and the process from before, we had a very high application to hire ratio. I believe it was um, around 50 applications to one hire. 
and um, we're looking to reduce that significantly. Um, again, that will have all of those things are going to have an impact on time to hire. So we really want candidates to be applying and then to be booked into one of those regular assessment centres that we can that we've already got pre-booked in um, to then uh, go through the pro pro um, the process more smoothly. And for those you know where there's only a small office with a small number of candidates, we don't have to wait a long time to do that. And finally, the the 22% reduction in team resource, and this has already been um, uh, implemented really. I mean, we haven't reduced any of our um, permanent headcount, but we don't have um, to have all these uh, the extra fixed term contractors to um, help us uh, get through that high volume of of um, video interviews and all the other work that comes with it, essentially. Um, and there's a number of other efficiencies as well that have helped us reduce team resource. So we, um, without the um, assessment centre platform that we had, um, it was all done obviously face to face and collecting papers and things. Um, and you know that was taking you know team some team members at the the height of the um, season you know three hours to do all the scanning afterwards um, to make sure we had all that documented. Whereas now on um, the, the impact platform from Amjack moving forward, um, it's all on there and logged and digitally saved. So we don't have to, you know, go around collecting lots of score papers and things like that. It's all, you know, so there's, there's various efficiencies like that that are really going to help us um, this year. Lovely. Thank you, David. And, and I'll sort of take back and maybe answer the question of how we're achieving this. Um, <laughs> We've talked a bit about what the process used to be like and, and obviously what we expect to be able to achieve by way of results and um, the, the ways that the, the sort of beauty of this process is it's being um, achieved through just two very simple technology interventions. The first one is HypoI. So the three tests that um, a BDO used to use plus the video interview are all being replaced by HypoI and I'll bring that to life. And then the other technology and intervention that David's referenced a couple of times is IMPACT, which is our virtual assessment centre platform, which is going to create all those wonderful efficiencies around um, the assessment centre stage. So just talk a little bit about HypoI. What, what is HypoI? Um, we've talked a bit about potential already and the importance of assessing potential in this hugely uncertain world. Um, and the fact that when you know, certainty, um, the only certainty is uncertainty, potential is all that matters and, and HypoI is a psychometric that has been designed to assess potential and it's the only tool in the market that does that on an automated basis. It's anchored in the HypoI model, um, the Amberjack HypoI model and the, the Amberjack HypoI model focuses on grit. So in this world that's constantly changing, critical um, criteria for success and, and you know, just for, for those of you who haven't heard about the Amjack Hypo model before, this is all anchored in our insights, um, annual insights research that we do. It's anchored in five, um, five, seven years, five or seven years worth of um, specific research into each of these criteria that underpin potential. And the, the critical criteria behind it are, yeah, as I say, grit. So this is your resilience, your ability to keep going, to keep focusing on achieving objectives, no matter what the future holds and whatever's thrown at you, to remain agile um, when things are changing and to keep those levels of energy up in the face of adversity. I've talked a bit about um, you know, the future of where everything's heavily automated and the fact that you know, the left brain, more linear tasks are going to be more heavily um, you know, attributed towards the technology and the, the, the people, the people who supplement that technology, our point of differentiation is some of the more right brain thinking, that creative thinking, that joined up thinking, holistic thinking, our ability to think about the future and to have vision and to be agents of change. Obviously, in a world which is highly automated, a digital mindset is critical. And we're not talking about technical capability necessarily. We're not talking about a world where everybody has to be a coder. But we are talking about a world in which people need to think digital first in terms of solutions. You need to be able to work with coders in order to embrace the digital potential. And a world in which we're moving away from you know, pure measures of IQ, intellectual quotient, G, general intelligence, 
to the ways in which you apply your intelligence. So we're now in this Google enabled world. It's not about what you know, it's about how you apply what you know. It's about that level of agility, but it's also about the emotional and social awareness that enables you to apply that intellectual quotient as effectively as possible. So it's applied intellect rather than pure intellect. And these are the four pillars of the Amberjack Hypo model. And this is what um, uh, the, the Hypo I tool assesses. How does it do it? Well, as I mentioned, it's one assessment that replaces what was previously four stages in, in the BDA recruitment process. I won't call it your process, David, because I know you inherited it. Um, and, and so um, what it does is it covers off uh, numerical, verbal reasoning, critical thinking. So it covers off those applied, those um, intellect aspects, but it covers them in an applied context through so real work-based scenarios but it also looks at things from a behavioral perspective. So it covers off the three other anchors of the hypo I framework as well. And it looks at the whole person. And this is really critical because historically, as I said, people have looked, built up a picture of a whole person over the recruitment process, but often in the early stages, they've only looked at one narrow dimension. So at one particular stage, they might've assessed somebody's um, numerical reasoning capability. Now, HyperI enables you to look at that whole person in one stage so that you don't have false negatives or false positives. And it also enables you to move away from assessing what somebody's done before to assess their, their future potential, to assess how they can apply you know, their skills and abilities and knowledge and unique characteristics um, in future contexts. It's highly efficient for candidates, as I've mentioned, because it's one um, 30 to 40 minute assessment as opposed to three tests, which each would have been about that duration plus a video interview. So significantly reduces the time asked for candidates. But it's also really efficient for recruiters because it removes the need to move candidates through multiple assessment stages to chase candidates who might have stalled in the process. And it also gives you all of those data points in one, at one stage. Because candidates don't have all the different hurdles, they're less likely to withdraw. Um, and it gives you um, the not just the data points in relation to the um, automated aspects of the recruitment process, but it also finishes with the video interview questions. Now, from a candidate experience perspective, that's really important. One of the things candidates have always found quite challenging about automated assessments is that they never feel like they have the opportunity to bring them there. Um, proposition or themselves to life. They, they feel like a number going through a process. So integrating the opportunity for candidates to articulate you know, their motivation and their drive and to respond to some um, questions linked to the HIPO framework uh, really enhances that candidate experience. But it also means that recruiters can go straight in and just focus on the video responses for those candidates who've met the benchmark in terms of the, um, the automated aspects of the score. From a, again, candidate experience perspective, it has a very comprehensive feedback report, which is importantly, it's development led. So it's very, it's full of constructive suggestions and recommendations for self-improvement. But I think one of the things it's also really important about, although today is um, all focused in you know, efficiency, one of the effectiveness measures as I mentioned before, from our perspective is the diversity of the cohort that ends up getting recruited. And HypoI is, you know, without question, the most inclusive psychometric um, that's ever been designed. And, and the reason why I can make that claim is because it's inclusive by design. We haven't gone out and created a, a psychometric and then afterwards gone and sense checked it against, um, you know, uh, from an adverse impact perspective. We've actually partnered with different um, organisations in order to ensure that we're designing a tool that is truly inclusive. So, from a disability perspective, we've got. Um, We've, we've partnered with an organization called Text Help who have SpeechStream, which is a, a tool that is, creates the greatest level of accessibility for any kind of candidate, whether it, if they have, they're colorblind and they need the colors automatically changed, whether they need text um, you know, expanded, whatever it is that they need to have to, in order to make their experience optimal, um, Text Help is uh, able to automatically adjust it and they don't have to come to recruiters and ask for help. They can self-manage to create their best possible experience. We also partner with um, Nancy Doyle, who some of you may know from the BBC show Employable Me. Um, she's an occupational psychologist with a special expertise around neurodiversity, leads an organisation called Genius Within. She's also on the BPS testing board. And we've worked with her and with her a, a pool of 
um, high performing, high potential neurodiverse talent in order to make sure that we're creating the optimal experience and so that we're not um, accidentally sifting out uh, atypical but high potential talent um, and so the tool is um, specifically designed with that at its core. From an ethnicity perspective, you know, we've actually been um, so championing for a long time that the bar around this has not been high enough. The 80-20 rule does not fit for purpose. There shouldn't be any differences in scores, not just a 20% you know, uh, viability gap. Um, and we've also have been advocating for ages that you know, validation shouldn't happen on BAME as a group, but we should be looking at differences of scores for each individual group within the BAME category. So the HypoI tool has been uh, validated on uh, again, uh, with um, representation from each individual ethnic group as opposed to looking at BAME as a whole category. From a social mobility perspective, because we're assessing for future potential, not past experience, we're automatically ensuring that we're as, um, you know, as open as possible for people who might not have had that same level of past experience, uh, past opportunity. From a gender perspective, the tool is time recorded, not time limited. And that goes all the way through to some of the video interview questions as well, which the research has shown is really important from a, um, a female inclusivity perspective. We're also focusing on the whole person, as I mentioned, rather than just indexing on individual um, criteria, and particularly when you focus over index on numerical ability at the expense of the whole person, you typically introduce the potential for adverse impact on a gender basis. And from an overall candidate experience perspective, again, inclusivity from the start and the core videos include people from a wide range of um, geographic locations, settings from all around the globe. They represent different religions, different food types. They showcase people with disabilities in high performing contexts. There's a lot of multicultural representation in all the items. And so this one test short and it, this short test punches well above its weight in terms of the impact it's able to deliver. And for BDO, we're going to be able to achieve a 60-70% sift out on the automated aspects and then the typical 50-60% um, sift out on the video aspect, which makes the overall tool capable of you know, sifting out up to 80-90% of a pipeline in order to ensure that you've got your optimal pool for assessment centre. Um, and then at the assessment centre stage, um, you'll obviously then be able to introduce further efficiencies in the way that David's already highlighted. And we referenced that the Assessment Centre is um, being supported and hosted this year on Impact, which is Amberjack's virtual or digital assessment centre platform. Now, Impact, um, it, the, the efficiencies come um, throughout the process. I think David's talked a little bit about some of the administration that is removed by this platform. Um, once you've set up an assessment centre in Impact, it takes a matter of minutes to set up another assessment centre. So if you think about all of the scheduling effort, all of the, um, you know, the timetabling effort that goes into a typical assessment centre or the printing of all the different materials, all of that um, vanishes when you run an assessment centre through Impact. Then when you layer in all the opportunities that David's highlighted where you can run assessment centres that include multiple locations, multiple business streams at a time where you can share your assessor resource across offices without having the, you know, the challenge of geography, you can create some really very efficient, um, efficient outcomes. You can also um, make adjustments on the day very easily. You can run your wash up much more efficiently and effectively because you have all of the data points automatically pre-populated through to your wash up grid. You can drive um, feedback much more rapidly because all of those data points and comments can automatically pre-populate through to feedback generation. And really importantly, from an effectiveness point of view and from a data point of view, you securely capture in the moment all of that really critical final stage assessment centre feedback and scores which often, as important as they are, are, are you know, become a victim of um, you know, I, uh, challenges with hiring managers not completing or, or with that information not being lo um, loaded back through to your, your system of record. So we, um, David's obviously shared through the efficiencies that we were planning to create and we're going to create those efficiencies simply by introducing HypoI and then Impact. Both of these tools are 
very easy to deploy, have open APIs, they're easy to integrate if you wish to, but also work very well from a standalone perspective. Um, and, and both of these tools um, have off-the-shelf options. So Impact, for example, for BDO, we are using with um, BDO's existing assessment centre materials. We've adapted them ever so slightly, but the, the core existing materials we've been able to put into the platform. And their use of HyperI, they're actually using our off-the-shelf, out-of-the-box um, solution which, you know, is, although it's out off the shelf, it is actually unique. So every single instance of HyperI that's created has a unique item set or question set. Um, and we're able to tailor those questions to ensure that the context in which they're set is appropriate for your organization without impacting the integrity of the items. There is also a, a version of, of Impact or the option within Impact to have a spate version where you get your own opportunity to introduce video content and spate to your organisation and do a further level of, of bespoking and framing. But Impact, just, uh, HyperI just requires um, eight days to implement and Impact can be implemented in, in less than two. And that gives people a little bit of a, an idea, perhaps, not only of the efficiencies and uh, effectiveness in opportunities, but also that they're not necessarily beyond um, reach and importantly David's been able to achieve all of this within his previous spend so there is no additional spend um, for David's team this year over and above previous years and actually in certain circumstances uh, introducing these tools could potentially introduce some quite significant cost savings um, and I think probably what we've already inferred from a resource point of view David might be he's managed to maintain his hard cost spend but he has been able to significantly reduce his soft cost spend across the the team without the need for the outsource or the um the uh, additional um fixed term contractors so i'm going to to pause at that point and and perhaps um this is the moment um stephen where the three of us might want to turn our video back on just in case there might be some questions Fantastic. Thanks, I can do that. Was, that was really interesting. Um, um, yeah, so just a reminder that for those um, listening to this, um, if you want to ask a question, just pop it into the, into the dialogue box and then I'll, I'll pass them through. So we have had one. Um, so this has come from Jade. Um, so Jade said, um, really interesting. Um, she's interested in actually, um, do your customers or, or maybe yourself, David, are, um, do you use this for experienced hire as well as early talent? So it's only for um, uh, early talent this year at the moment. Um, we uh, have done some work with Amajack around our um, uh, competency framework and all of our question banks and things like that for experienced hire. But at the moment in BDO, we don't use online assessments for experienced hire. Now that is, we have a large project to review that. And I, I suspect at some point in the future, we will be um, certainly using this or some other uh, version from Amajack to do that. But currently, um, inexperienced hire and BDO, we don't use it. I have used it um, in previous organisations. And I think that's a great response here because I think earlier on this year before coronavirus, the intention had been that this would be across both aspects of you know future talent and experienced hire. And actually the process was going to look reasonably similar. I think some aspects of the automation um, pre-virtualization and coronavirus were going to be a little bit harder to stomach in the experienced tire space, but actually nowadays, post-coronavirus, we're actually finding the pace of virtualization and digitization is greater in experienced tire than future talent because future talent recruiters were already further along the curve. Um, mm. So we are increasingly finding actually, and I'm, I'm doing a webinar on exactly this topic in a few years time, a few weeks time, experienced hire teams looking at what they can learn from future talent teams and looking at some of these tools that have been driving these efficiencies and creating optimal processes um, in future talent, but for experienced hire teams. And so my sort of prediction, although this is still very much something that's in flow, but is that, you know, this time next year, we'll be seeing a lot more experienced hire recruiting, replicating aspects of the future talent process and elements of online assessment, but, you know, we'll, we'll be increasingly finding their way perhaps into some of the more high volume aspects of experienced hire recruiting. And as we already know, video interviewing and um, virtual assessment has had to become a reality for recruiting at, at all levels within an organization. So um, hypo has been deliberately designed to work for experienced hire as well as for future talent. 
Um, and we, we actually just have little things like two versions of some of the introductory videos and things which are pitched at slightly different um, groups within an organization. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, we were, I think originally in scope, we were looking to do that, we, but we're also implementing Workday this year as well. So um, some of that has been put back, some of the sort of larger scale things that we're doing for to encompass the whole company, both EH, uh, Experience Time and Early Careers is um, uh, just sort of been postponed a little bit whilst we manage our Workday implementation on top of this. Busy year, David, <laughs> on top of everything else. Um, and and <laughs> um, uh, another couple of questions that have come through from from Ali, and the first one actually, well, it, it's it's um, um, relates to the experience type question, but it's about apprentices. So actually, is the same process also used for apprentices as well as for graduates? Yeah, absolutely. So it's the same process. It's um, different benchmarks, um, and uh, we are going through that process at the moment where we. Um, are reviewing the performance scores of all of our trainees currently, and then we're gonna um, uh, we, we are set, sort of setting that up. But essentially, it's going to be used across all of our trainees. I think it's maybe just worth saying that there's sometimes a distinction between the types of apprentices. So I think in BDO, your apprentices are, are broadly going into a fairly similar role to the the role of graduates, aren't yeah. they? Um, yeah, very. That's a very good point. So our uh, apprentices are essentially you know, they're still doing the same traineeship um, with BDO. It's just starting earlier in the sort of qualification process, really. So they're pretty similar. Uh, one of the things that we were very mindful of doing in the design of HyperWire is making sure that, that the, you know, the tool is appropriate for all sorts of apprenticeship types. So mm. it works very well in the professional context, but also for organisations that might be recruiting some of the lower level apprenticeships, perhaps into manufacturing or um, you know, factory style environments or retail, um, you know, that the tool can also be deployed in that context. But as David said, with different benchmarks and just have to make sure that we do all the norming and the, you know, the um, validation when we implement the tool. But actually, there's a follow on question a bit related to that, um, and it's around the algorithm. So, um, Ali Guinness asks us actually, so if you do use any publicly available data in your or algorithms, or does it sort of all come from the from the client base? No, it's it, it, we, we're publishing all of the validation data that sits behind the Hypo I tool. Um, another question here has come through from, from Darren, Darren Page. Hi, Darren. Um, so Darren's um, interested to know about the, the time to hire and getting that down to, to, to two weeks. Um, so I remember back in my days of big four recruits, we were trying to get it down from 11 weeks. <laughs> the, um, that was a few years ago. Um, uh, but Darren's asking actually about, um, is it, do you recruit on a first come first serve basis? And if you do, does that then um, give you any concerns around actually what people just may not be in a position to apply? Um, you know, um, early on, so actually are there some talent pools that maybe you miss out on if that's the case? So we do hire on a first come first serve basis. We have um, assessment centres, we'll be booking them going through all the way to Christmas. Um, and so people who are applying later will still be able to visit those assessment centres further down the line. So um, yes, the people that apply right at the beginning of the season are going to get those early assessment centres, which we're pre-booking in all the way through to Christmas. And as I say, we can, uh, because we can merge them all to, into one, we can set those dates now rather than worrying about when we get the applications. Um, and then, of course, if people apply later, further down the line, then um, there will be, uh, at the moment, I think we're going to probably have two a week. Um, we're still reviewing exactly how that's going to work. Um, all the way through to at least Christmas and then actually of course we'll have some beyond that particularly um, for apprentices with National Apprenticeship Week and things like that but obviously the, the largest bulk of them we'd expect um, to get in then really. Um, so um, I'm not sure we have concerns about some of the uh, uh, applicants applying later on, we still will have some of those assessment centres going um, but the um, well, certainly for BDO, our busiest time for getting those applicants is October, September a lot as well, but it really peaks around October. Um, so, so we'll be able to manage those and hopefully, um, you know, hire those before Christmas. I think you do have the advantage of significant vacancy volumes, don't you, David? And so for other members who perhaps have far smaller intakes, it might be more of a consideration because people will be able to still apply for a role and receive have a, the same chance of getting the role even if it's mm. you know a couple of months in and even though your process is that rapid 
Um, and I think the only thing I'd say is in all the research that we've seen and all the research we've conducted, you can typically find as much evidence to suggest it's harder doing it later than earlier and in situations where you're likely to be inundated with applicant volumes, you're either going to have to really push the thresholds on some of your assessment tools, which as we've talked about before, does run a fairly a very significant risk of adverse impact, or you're going to have to manage the opening and closing of your vacancies. And we'd argue that the, the more transparent way is to, as long as you're clearly communicating when your vacancies will open and when they're shut, is actually to, to do it up front and to let candidates know this is the applicant application window and shorten that application window um, in order to make sure that you know they have the option to apply um, in that window rather than being sifted out because you're just in a situation. I think everyone will be in a situation in which they are inundated with volume. One of our, our largest clients opened for applications the day, the day before yesterday and they received 6,000 applications in their first day. Um, now, they typically re receive tens of thousands of applications, but I think it just goes to prove that what we're all expecting is happening this season. Candidates are going to be applying to many more organisations than they might typically have applied to. And those who are really serious about getting a job are, are on it. They're applying you know, in the second week in August um, in, a, in, a, in a volume that you wouldn't normally expect. So I think this year uh, is probably minimal risk to having short, sharp um, application windows so long as they're clearly communicated. Yeah, I think that's something all employers are um, are thinking about. Something that's come up come up a few times. Um, I've also had a question. Um, Darren asked actually, how long did it take you to do the whole rollout process? You know, from design to to implementation. So I'm trying to remember how long it's how long it's been now. So we are just putting together the final touches on it. Most of the work has been done. Um, when did we start, Sophie? A couple of months second ago. Of second week in July, David, was when we we second signed off the. Exactly. Yeah. So the final things we're doing at the moment is a lot of the benchmarking around our current trainees to make sure we get those um, pass marks uh, right when we open. Um, so we've had a number of our a large portion of trainees do the um, high prior already, and then we're comparing that with their um, performance rating so we can get that as accurate as possible. And then once we've done those final few things, we're pretty much ready to go. Pretty, pretty and that's the time-consuming piece, actually, getting people to complete the assessment and then being able to do the analysis of the data does take a little bit of lapse time. Um, but everything else, really, from a, um, it's a high pi point of view, is pretty much good to go, um, which is one of the beauties of it in this context. Um, I've got a question actually that occurred to me. Um, if anybody's watching this on record, um, we're actually live. This is on A level results day. And, and just as I was listening to the whole presentation, I was wondering if this just takes us even further away um, from the need to look at A level grades as part of the sifting tool. You know, I mean, I started doing accountancy recruitment 20 years ago when actually A level grades were the, you didn't have them, you just didn't get into the process. I mean, is it getting to the point where we just don't need to look at that kind of um, information at, at the early stages because testing is so sophisticated? I, yes, is the simple answer, very definitely. I think the only caveat I might put on this, and this is a conversation David and I have had a few times, is that the, there are some of the professional bodies, and you know, and I, when I say some of them, I'll, I'll be quite specific, I think particularly the accountancy professional body um, still anchors quite heavily in um, assessments which proxy academic success. There are two papers, one in the early stages, like the, typically they sit around October, and I think one about 18 months in, which are really highly technical papers. Um, and the, the evidence does suggest a correlation between um, you know, academic performance and performance in those particular tests. Now, when we dig a little bit deeper, I think it's a familiarity effect and that seems to be what the, the deeper evidence suggests that people who are familiar with taking a more academic and more technically focused test exam typically will pass more rapidly. Um, so what we would say is absolutely your first point, move further away from the academics, but just be aware that if there is a highly technical or academic aspect to professional qualification, individuals who haven't done those assessments so maybe they've done more a humanities route than a financial route or they may have done less well on those papers will probably need some extra support they'll probably need to do more practice papers they might need in-person coaching rather than just online training to pass those more technical papers 
but we would say that there's an inverse correlation with some of the um, attributes which predict performance in those exams <laughs> with mm -hmm. overall success in the organisation. So the right thing is to focus on the whole, whole person, the right thing is to focus on assessment of potential, but just beware that that's the one thing um, that you might need to look out for if put some extra interventions into support. Um, did you have any thoughts on that, that David? No, I'd, I'd echo everything um, Sophie said, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I think certainly um, from people I've spoken to in the industry that, you know, there's hints of going more that way. But but yeah, absolutely. I agree with Sophie on that. Yeah. Um, the fact I remember from my time at both UI and PwC is that it's, it's not so much the grades, it is it's the, if you're used to studying for A-levels, it's something about the volume you need of, of knowledge to get through. And, professional qualifications that, that yeah. can't be avoided. Yeah. Um, I'm conscious of time, but we have got one more question that we haven't covered. And I think this one is probably for you, Sophie. Um, and this was around algorithms, but around video interviews. So um, I didn't know this was a thing, but um, video interviews using algorithms based on social media data. I don't know, but I, but I have heard about people questioning algorithms being used in on video interviews. I don't know, did you have a view on, on those and whether they, they are um, a good validation tool? Um. We, we do have a fairly strong perspective on this and then this is that we feel at the moment that the it's a little bit like the, the algorithms are being used there, there are a, a problem in, a solution in search for a problem almost that we're, we're employing the best of technology rather than looking at the right things and seeing how technology can assess them so one of the things that worries me most in some of the algorithmic review of um, video interviews is that, you know, unless you've got a perfect data set, which is almost unachievable, you're, you're building in and in magnifying um, biases. And also the things that they're assessing almost have innate biases in them. It, it, once we get to a world, and I think we're not far away, so I, I definitely think this is the future, um, we'll have tools that are properly assessing the, the typical psychological underpinnings and neuroscientific underpinnings of effective performance. Whereas at the moment, they're typically assessing things like um, you know, micro gestures, um, level of blood in the face, you know, keywords, sorts of things which actually don't directly correlate with job performance. And although we are seeing correlation between you know, human assessor outcomes and automated algorithmic outcomes, you know, ultimately, I don't think we're in a situation in which we can have confidence that they're drawing those conclusions on anything other than the basis that we're embedding um, some of the, the, you know, the human biases in the outcomes. And so I think it's the direction of travel. I don't yet think we're there yet. And I think it's going to be wave two of the algorithmic assessments, which is the one to watch. I feel like we've kind of got, come down the, the, the um, steep slope and we're in the bounce back, but the bounce back is going to look pretty different from the first wave. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you. That's all the questions. That's all we've got time for. We've been on for just over an hour. So um, really insightful um, webinar. Thank you very much. I've, I've, I've learned a lot. It's really, really impressive work. So Sophie and David, really appreciate you giving the time. You know, it's, um, how busy you both are um, implementing this. So, so very much appreciated. Um, so just a reminder, um, this webinar um, it will be on our YouTube channel with all our other webinars. Um, please feel free to share, go back and revisit stuff that you want to want to recap and also look out for our other webinars and podcasts that will also go into some of the other themes that we touched in a little bit throughout this, this, this webinar. Um, thank you very much for all your time. Hope you're all not melting in the heat and a, a virtual round of applause online for you both, Sophie and David. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Talk to you both soon. Thank you. Thanks very Thanks much. You.